All right, so golf is back in many ways and we'll be fully back next week on the PGA Tour, but we've seen some charity events involving the likes of Rory McIlroy and Dustin Johnson. We had that near meltdown from Tom Brady who had the perfect amateur golfer's round when he had many shots out of bounds, but he also hit two of the greatest shots of his life to keep him coming back. And tomorrow we see the Paddy Power Golf Shootout. It is a blockbuster event which will feature an all-star cast of golf pros and celebrity amateurs, including Irish golfing legend and Ryder Cup winning captain paul mcginley who's with me now evening paul thank you thank you for the big introduction if this is what's written in front of me you get <laughs> okay. the, you get irish golfing legend and Ryder cup captain paul mcginley yeah. tv presenter piers morgan and england captain harry kane who's going to arrive direct it seems <laughs> from tottenham training so this event mm. at the paddy power golf shootout it's behind closed doors obviously it's at the centurion club in england uh, consists of two parts it's a series of skills challenges before culminating with a unique new golf format, the shootout. So the pros involved, not a bad lineup, Tommy Fleetwood, Beef Johnson, Thomas Bjorn, Carly Booth and yourself. And then as for the amateurs, you've got Harry Kane, Piers Morgan, Peter Crouch, Freddie Flintoff and Jamie Redknapp. So uh, an interesting afternoon in store, I'd imagine. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, just like we've seen, as you said, the Rory matches and the Tiger matches in the last few weeks in the PGA Tour. This is our introduction here in Europe. Uh, it's going to be on Sky TV. We're going to be adhering to all the uh, health and safety guidelines put in place by the British government. Um, and we've got um, the European Tour doctor, uh, Andrew Murray, who's overseeing the start of the European Tour in a few weeks' time. He's going to be going to use this uh, very much as, as a uh, adhere to all exactly the same uh, testing procedures and use that as a, a bit of a feedback for him as he prepares okay. for, the, for the big opening. So a unique golf format, a skills challenge. What's the skills challenge entail? We've got a couple of things in there, and Harrington will be the good one at this. We're doing the Happy Gilmore. I mean, I've been right. trying to practice it myself today. That's not easy as it looks. I could end <laughs> up on my ass very quick. It's uh, <laughs> you Well, listen, if you want advice, it. Podrick has no problem doing a video <laughs> with any tips you need. He doesn't need a second invitation, it seems. <laughs> no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He loves to chat as well, too. So, uh, he's uh, yeah, there's going to be that. There's going to be a chip and contest part three. There's all going to be that, all those kind of fun things going on. A skills challenge, really, and a, a mixture of uh, the celebrities and the pros. A bit like, like they had a few weeks ago mm. where, with the Tiger Field thing and, and those American footballers. Along those lines, it's a fun thing. It's going to raise money for the good charities. And, uh, and as I say, introduce golf back to Europeans. Have you been taking on board all the various criticisms that go with these celebrity shootout type events of how you do make it interesting, how you do make it exciting? Because like, the Rory Dustin Johnson one, despite Rory's best efforts, was, was dullish. But they seem to learn a lot for the Tiger Phil. And a lot of it, I think, was basically down to Tom Brady. And it's like Tom Brady, it felt like his entire sporting reputation was at stake after six, seven holes. It had turned into such an absolute nightmare. And him, it felt like arguably the worst seven handicapper ever seen and then he hits this miraculous shot and it sort of brought everybody into it like are you do you want your amateurs to be good or are you hoping that there's a few cringeworthy moments from them oh we want cringeworthy moments they're the best ones aren't they <laughs> so uh yeah you know what i, I think the tiger phil thing learned a lot not maybe not from the rory the rory game um but they learned a lot from the 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 horrible thing they did last year in Vegas, playing for mm -hmm. all those millions of dollars, the gaudiness of that. I think they realized they got so many things wrong on that level. That was just, it was a non-event. It was slow moving. Everything was wrong about it. And I think they came away, learned a huge amount from it and, and, and righted a lot of those wrongs with this one and adding in the footballers and he was going to bring a whole new audience anyway, guaranteed. So um, it's like all of these things. We've got to think with a new mindset, uh, Nathan. We've got to think outside. We, can't think with our normal logic here. We've got to think outside the box and, and reinvent things because we've we got to get used to it because I think this is here for quite a while. Yeah, sure is. Pro-Ams are uh, really a uniquely golf event and I'm sure you've played in hundreds, if not thousands of them down through the years. Like, on a Wednesday ahead of a big tournament, when you're at your peak, did you enjoy playing Pro-Ams? Uh, I always enjoy them, but they are a distraction, to be honest. If you want to be ruthless as a competitor, mm. um, really, they, they can be a distraction. And the other thing is you're using up energies. Um, you know, it's very important to preserve energy. It's something I learned as my career went on, and I'm, I'm very strong in it now, a lot stronger now than I was uh, when I was when I was playing uh, and conserving energies uh, and and uh, you know when you play in a pro am for example in Wentworth which is a celebrity pro am um, it can take up to six hours to play. Mm. Uh, say you are playing with somebody like Harry Kane and um, 
somebody else, you know me, two celebrities in every group, so I'd say Harry Kane and, and Jamie Redknapp. And there's masses of autogra autographs to be done. And there's loads of selfies nowadays to be done. And you're out there for six hours. Normally it's quite hot. The weather is, is good. It's the middle of summer. And it's a, as much as you play golf and enjoy the day, you still have a massive tournament to prepare for tomorrow. And you depleted some of your energies by playing in it. So uh, it's, that's why Tiger always played dead early. He played at seven o'clock. He was always first out in the pro-am. He wanted to get it over with and play with the chief executives or whoever they were. And then he'd be gone out of the golf course by lunchtime and give himself the afternoon to recover. So um, if you're talking from a pure rootless uh, um, mindset of a performer yes they are a distraction but if you're also talking about the value they can get from them and they're always good fun to play I've never not enjoyed mm. playing them yeah and the value you get from them it's probably going to be something we see more of as golf tries to almost reinvent itself with behind closed doors golf and trying to get the television audiences that they need and the interest level that they need and there have been some developments over the last few weeks so we now see that the European Tour is going to return with this UK swing a run of six events just all within the UK so players can come in and they don't have to leave for almost two months. From where you were a couple of months ago and your thoughts as to how golf was going and how much trouble was golf was going to be in coming out of this COVID-19 crisis, have your views changed at all? No, no, they haven't, Nathan. I mean, I, I think when you see the prize funds down in a million euros, it shows you uh, what, what, we're, what we're going to be facing. Um, I mean, there'll be a number of tournaments that escalate up from that. Mm. Um, but I, I think in Europe, we're going to, we're, the gulf between the PGA Tour and the European Tour could well extend. Uh, and the reason I say that is they're sitting, you know, on a, on a, uh, a big windfall of money. Uh, they're sitting on a large reservoir of funds. Um, that they have as a PGA Tour. They're a very wealthy organization, several hundred million by all accounts uh, they have. Uh, they just signed a deal for over a billion dollars, a new TV deal, ironically, two or three days before COVID hit. Um, so there's no problem over there with finance. And also they have a massive advantage over us because they have charitable status. So when, when companies come and put money into the PGA Tour, it's not just from a sponsor's point of view, they get huge tax exemptions because right. they are playing and donating to a charity, even though it's a PGA Tour event. So we don't have that in Europe. You know, when we're dealing with the economic crisis that is, that is hitting and is about to hit even more, I'm sure, companies will, will, will be reluctant um, to let spend money on, on, on corporate hospitality. They'll be reluctant to put in several million to, in promoting all, all kinds of sporting events. Um, and also, we're a lot more international than, than they are. So I think we are facing some tough times, but we are prepared for the European Tour. We have, a, we have a very strong board, very strong chief executive and chairman who are incredibly strong, uh, incredible uh, experiences between them. Uh, and we've been preparing for this for quite a while. Um, and uh, it's great to just get these events going up and running. And, and we will improve and the monies will escalate a little bit in terms of prize mm. money. But the most important thing was to get out there uh, with a schedule. And, and that's what we've done with an outline schedule. Have you been able to get any sense of the stress that this is causing your regular European Tour player? Like if you think as go back 10, 15 years into your, right in the heart of your European Tour career, as prize funds were building all the time. If you were to look at this where you go from Rolex series events at this stage mm -hmm. of the season worth seven million quid, we should be just out of an, an Irish Open, which ironically would have been played in glorious weather, and at least the yeah. seven million prize fund to going around the UK playing for a million quid an event. Would, would you be worried about your future? I wouldn't be worried, no. I, I think, uh, like everybody in the game, Nathan, I think there's going to be a natural, a natural alignment here with the PGA Tour in time. How short term or how long term that is, I don't know. But I think that that's the future for the European Tour. We'll, we, we, we'll align with the PGA Tour and be part, become part of their umbrella. I think that will be good for the game. I don't know anybody in the game who would be anti that. It's been widely talked about, mm. widely speculated about. And I think that will, that will happen. Um, how does that work? Is, is but, the European Tour a feeder tour for the PGA Tour? Well, I, I, I don't know how it's going to work because it hasn't been negotiated mm -hmm. now. But I, how I would see it would that the, the PGA Tour could well take a number of our events and put it on their schedule and count it in the FedEx or, or make it part of the PGA Tour full schedule. So some of their players could come over and play, for example, the Scottish Open the week before um, the, uh, the Open Championship. Or they could play Abu Dhabi earlier in the year or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, they would take our, our Wentworth, whatever, whatever those tournaments are. And at the same time, though, and this is where we have to be very careful and very strong uh, in the European Tour, um, and certainly at board level, is that they don't just come in and take our best tournaments and push the other ones away. We have to make sure that there is a future and a sustainability 
um, and an umbrella uh, of security around, you know, at least 20, 25 other events, 30 events on the European tour um, that, that are not just going to disappear, that they're just not going to take our best ones, that they also secure the other ones as well, too. So I think there, there will become a kind of a pyramid uh, mm. pyramid system, which is already in kind of place at the moment through the top 50 in world rankings. As guys get into the top 50, they escalate themselves over to a PGA Tour. So I think that will happen in time, Nathan. It's not imminent. Uh, certainly won't happen this year or maybe next. But, but after that, I, I think that's a natural flow that we're going to see in golf. Do you think we'll get an Irish Open this year? I'm hopeful, and Keith Kelly is pretty sure there is. Yeah, he's very gung-ho. I spoke to him only yesterday about it, and he's pretty gung-ho that he's going to make this happen some way or other. Nice. Um, he's, he's going to do it. So, fingers crossed. I, I know I, I saw the irony last week of the weather. All the Irish <clears> Opens we had, if you were there in May when the weather was atrocious, and then to have the weather week we had last week. But now, Julia, it would have been splendid. Mm. But anyway, we've got to deal with a lot of other things as well. Who knows? Maybe we'll have a warm October and uh, somehow things will work out all right. Uh, so this week, you've got all the golfing attention on uh, your event at Centurion. Next week, the PGA Tour is back, uh, the Charles Schwab Championship. And again, like under so many clouds, 6,000 Americans have died this week from COVID-19, yet still sport is resuming in the country and Donald Trump wants sport to resume. And it looks as though they're going to get quite a field as well. Rory McIlroy is committed to playing, Brooks Kepka, John Ram, Dustin Johnson. Uh, so many of the world's top 20 are going to be there, which to be honest, I think when we spoke about this a couple of months ago, we didn't expect it, a feeling that a lot of people would maybe buy their time, see how it works out, see how many people are on the ground. But there's clearly a desire amongst the world's best golfers to get out there as soon as possible. Are you surprised to see so many of them out as quickly as they are? Not really, not really. I mean, a lot of them have been living down in Florida, Nathan, remember, as well. And um, although not everywhere in Florida, a lot of uh, counties in Florida have remained open. Um, uh, and same in Texas. So a lot of these places haven't shut down. A lot of players have been playing golf all the way through. So they feel that the game is in pretty good shape. Also, they missed the competition. And also, they've got their eye on the FedEx, which is going to be very closely finishing now in, in, in August and you know, running into September. So they really want to get up and running early and get prepared for this PGA Championship in particular, which is going to happen first week in August. Um, and, and, and then the US Open in September. So they want, to, they want to get the wheels turning again. And I'm not surprised, no. Mm. And potentially still a Ryder Cup, though everything seems to be moving in the direction that it will be pushed back a year. Steve Stricker was saying yesterday, the American captain, he expects a decision probably in the next two or three weeks. But to quote him, he said it would be a bit of a yawn without fans. A lot of the top players have come out saying that really they feel it wouldn't be a Ryder Cup. It couldn't be a Ryder Cup and it should be pushed back if fans aren't going to be there. The reasons for the delay for two or three weeks and your understanding of how Ryder Cups are put together, is part of this seeing how the Charles Schwab Championship and the Travelers Championship and these first three or four events go and see if a bit of momentum builds? Or are there just so many logistical reasons that there comes a point that they have to make a decision? So it's a combination of all of those things, Nathan. Um, you know, you're also, also dealing with Wisconsin as well, too, uh, the state governors there. And, and, and they're trying to get a, a view as to what their view uh, what, what their policy is going to be going forward in terms of health and safety and are they going to let crowds in, even if they're going to let small amount of crowds in or, or if they're not. So that's there. There's the financial implications of the Ryder Cup. You know, it makes a huge amount of money for the PGA of America and they're probably in all, you know, going to need that, need as much income as they can, mm -hmm. you know, as their members throughout America are obviously going to be suffering greatly from this crisis. Um, you're also looking at the scheduling for next year. If it is going to be cancelled, how does it fit in when there's already contracts in place for the President's Cup going to be held at Quail Hollow next year. The Olympics is going to be moved again next year. It's already a condensed uh, year. You've got the Salheim Cup as well next year. So you, you, uh, you've got TV schedules, TV companies putting their input in. You have a whole load of issues going on here. Um, but one of the things that I think we need to stay clear of in golf uh, is this idea that oh, we, we have such a unique atmosphere in the Ryder Cup and that we shouldn't play if we can't have that atmosphere. Because these are difficult times, uh, really difficult times for everybody, not just in the sport of golf, but all other sports. Mm. And while all other sports are doing everything they can to play without atmosphere, without crowds, and you know, by all accounts, Jordan Henderson is going to be lifting that the, the Premiership trophy in front of an empty cup. I mean, look at the atmosphere. That's got, there's going to be no atmosphere for such a momentous thing. Or you know, Man United play Liverpool with no crowds, and that, you know what that is like. You know, we see the Irish rugby are planning for playing matches later in the year with no crowds. You know, so while all these efforts have been made by other sports 
um, to play behind closed doors. We can't in golf have this attitude of, oh, we have no atmosphere and our atmosphere is so brilliant that we have to cancel. That's not a good enough reason, in my view, to cancel. If we are going to cancel, let's cancel it for health and safety, financial, all the other stuff that's in between as well, reasons. And it's important that we, that we, that we do it for those reasons um, and, and, and not the ones just of, of the ego of our, our event is so much better atmospheric than anybody else's. And I guess there are no guarantees either with this virus as to where we're going to be in 12 months time. There's no guarantee if you push it back to 2021 that you are going to have 100, 200,000 people over the course of a week making their way into the course. Absolutely. Well, there's no guarantees with anything, you know, and if you look, as we all come out of lockdown very slowly and very surely coming out of it, you know, I don't see in terms of mass gatherings of people and big crowds of 60, 70,000 people like you get at the Ryder Cup or soccer matches, you know, I can't see any government um, allowing that optic of that we had at Cheltenham or that we had at Liverpool, mm. Atletico Madrid, allowing that to happen again while there's still the potential of a second or third wave coming through, Nathan. So I think we're going, to, we're going to be at the end. I mean, mass gatherings of people is going to be quite a ways down the road. So that's why we got to pre get prepared and get ready for this new norm, as they call it, about what's coming in the next couple of months. And, and, and that is sport behind closed doors. So with that, all that in mind and everything you've said about like, taking, obviously, firstly, into account the health and safety side of it, but the financial side as well, would your feeling now, a couple of months out, three months out from a potential Ryder Cup, that it should go ahead? Um, my view on it at the moment is wait, to be honest. And I'm not okay. just put, I'm, 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 not, I'm not, not answering your question um, because things are happening and moving so mm. quickly, Nathan. Um, and I, would, I like to get a little bit more, uh, why, why make a decision now? I mean, we've got another six weeks, really, in theory. If there's going to be no crowds and there's going to be no infrastructure built, we've actually got really two months if we want it before we make that decision. So why rush to a decision now? Um, so let the wheels turn a little bit on the PGA Tour. Let people get used to watching golf behind closed doors. Let people get used to seeing other sports behind closed doors. Let the players become accustomed to what it's like playing without crowds. Um, and let's just gather a whole load of inf information. Um, and, and then, you know, policies will have changed in, in, in two, three, four, five, six weeks' time, whatever it may be. And we'll have more information then. And, and, and then, then let's make a decision. And, and I don't mean to not answer your question, but I, I think that's but the best play at this moment in time. Yeah, as you say, if, if there is no rush, and you do see that with an awful lot of sports, so why make these decisions so early? If you have the opportunity to bide your time, why not bide your time? As you say, like, everybody's learning, particularly when it comes to even the broadcast side of things. And we've seen bits and pieces of sport come back, and Bayern Munich play Borussia Dortmund, and it's a real high-quality game. There's no atmosphere, but you can still get the sense you're watching two of the best teams in Europe. And likewise, even going back to the tiger Phil match, suddenly a storyline develops and it becomes an interesting TV event. It will be interesting, I'm sure from your point of view as well, with your Sky hat on, watching a Charles Schwab as to what's it like if McElroy is in contention down the back nine, potentially, say, against a, a Brooks Kepka or a John Ram. Does it grab the, the TV viewer like it would if there are a few thousand people and there is the infrastructure and there is the big grandstand in 18? Or actually, can the quality of the play itself just encourage people to get get emotionally involved in it. Absolutely. And and that's what they all talk about this new norm, Nathan. That's what it is. We all this is coming at us fast and, and we'll adjust. You know, we're we're very resilient as human beings and, and we'll adjust to it. And we don't know what's going to happen as well with TV production. Now maybe TV production in a few weeks' time would be better than it is now. Um, even the first one. I, I what I'm expecting the first one or two in the PGA tour to be quite state affairs to be honest. Um, and, and, and they're going to be very safe. They're going to be, they're not going to try anything new. They just want to get a tournament done in a very uh, safe, safe way. But as, as we go through the first two, I think TV companies, production, the players, the PGA Tour themselves, they're going to learn so much from those. And I think then they'll become a little bit more ambitious and start putting extra things in. So I think the product will be better in week five than it will be in week one. And, and you take that evolution going forward to September, we may well have, a product that's very acceptable by then. And, mm. and um, you know, I read a great quote, and, I, and a friend of mine said to me today, an uh, Irish guy said it to me today, a good friend of mine, and he said, uh, the quote is, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself. It's to act with yesterday's logic. 
And I thought that's a very apt uh, line uh, in, in bearing in mind what we're going through and, and what they say, this term they use, the new norm. Mm. Uh, because we don't know. We've never experienced something like this before, Nathan. None of us, whether it's me or you in, in the media business or, or the players on the ground or the PGA Tour and European Tour putting on events or the Ryder Cup putting on events. We're making this up as we go. Um, and, and we're learning all the time. It's not just the cloud of... COVID-19 that golf in America is going to return under. It's also the cloud of the murder of George Floyd and the protests that have ensued over the past week. It's been interesting looking at how sport has responded. Almost every major sports person, and I think every major sporting organization have come out in America and made statements responding to the murder of George Floyd and to the protests, with the exception of the PGA Tour. And while a lot of those organizations you could say some of the words are quite hypocritical. It does still seem quite remarkable that the PGA Tour stands out. And in one sense, it's not surprising. It, maybe it's how low expectations can be for golf administration in America and how far removed it is seen still very much as a rich white guy's Trump supporting game in America. Mm. Like, are, are you surprised in any way that like, the PGA Tour, I know Jay Monaghan, I think he sent an internal memo to players saying he's trying to gather his thoughts to be the only major sporting organization not to make a statement does feel as though it really leaves them behind the curve. Yeah, no, I, I think they are gathering the information, to be honest, Nathan. I think by the end of, the end of today, we'll have something out. Um, you know, uh, we, we have um, the biggest the biggest sports star we have in the game mm. uh, is Tiger Woods. Um, and he brings so much, to, so much credibility to us because um, of who he is. Um, is the game in a good place in that regard? No. Can it be a whole lot better? Absolutely. But it has come a long way uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, you look at Augusta National. I mean, it's not long ago there was no black members uh, of Augusta National, for example. And mm. now there is, and, and, and several. And the same with, you know, golf clubs are frowned upon anywhere in the world now that don't have any um, minority members. Um, so um, it's important that we, um, we embrace what's going on in the world um, as a sport. Um, uh, I honestly think we, I honestly do honestly think we are, we are not a racist sport. I think uh, we've come from that place um, of, of white, white people and, and white rich people running the game. Um, uh, and, and I think we've evolved away from that. Mm. Have we a long way to go? Absolutely. But I think everybody in the world and every sporting organization has to look at itself and say, yes, there's a lot more we can do. Um, but I Golf honestly in don't particular, think though, we are I, I was, but golf in particular in America, you would have to say, has a huge way to go, considering what Tiger Woods has achieved over the last quarter of a century and having the most marketable, the most successful, the most brilliant sports person in the world, a black sports person leading golf. And still, a quarter of a century on, we have, what, two black golfers on the PGA Tour, himself and Harold Varner. It, it seems like a, an incredible missed opportunity that's probably gone forever now for the PGA Tour to take advantage and to get out into those minority communities over the last 25 years. And you'd have to question whether the real desire was there in American golf to go after that community. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I take that criticism, Nathan, and I'm certainly not going to argue against it. Um, I think, uh, I don't think we've missed the boat, that's for sure. I think as Tiger winds down his career and moves into other things, um, which is not too far away, I can see him getting a lot more involved, um, at, at, whether it be governmental level or whether it be growing the game um, through, through the black community, for example, in America. I can certainly see him doing something like that when he gets more time and more energy to, 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 to put into that because he hasn't really done so so far, you'd have to say. He's been there as an icon, but he hasn't got in um, at, at a very big level, but I'm sure he will in time. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, I take all your points, and um, I think uh, I certainly haven't come across it. Um, um, certainly, <laughs> my experiences in golf courses and places that I've been, I haven't come across it. Um, I'm not saying it's not there, but I certainly haven't come across it. Tiger, he made a statement, and the player who's really come to the fore, maybe not in, in this situation so far, but generally who's come to the fore, is Rory McIlroy and the way he's become so outspoken and even his comments on Donald Trump a couple of weeks ago saying that it's not the way a leader should act. While they may seem like obvious words to some people, for a golfer to come out and be critical of Donald Trump like that 
isn't remarkable in so many ways. And Rory to say he wouldn't play golf with him again. And you see Donald Trump ends up on the TV broadcast. It's put to Trump. And it could have, I don't want to say backfired massively on Rory, but it could have become this huge national story. The bravery, if that's the right word to use, that Rory has shown over the last few months and few years, it's, he's become this huge figure in sport. In a, all right, he's not Colin Kaepernick, but in golf, he has become very much the one outspoken personality and to have such a talent as that personality is, you got to say it's a really good thing for golf right now. Well, yeah, I think it's, I think it's good to have a spokesperson like Rory McIlroy saying these things, but you know, if I'm taking off my, 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 if, if I'm analyzing Rory McIlroy, or, 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 you know, one, one of the things, if you look at all the great sporting people throughout the history of the game, mm. um, very few of them, if any, besides maybe Muhammad Ali got involved, in um, in these kind of proclamations, in these stances, like you're talking about, that Rory seems to get involved in. Um, and I think the likes of Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan that we just saw in this great documentary and, you know, Messi and Ronaldo and all of the greats in all the sports, they don't get involved in that. They stay to what they're doing. They might have the views, but they do keep them private because they understand the focus required for them to reach the very top in their game. And they don't want any distractions. There will be a time and a place when when they feel they're they're not striving to be the best player in the world when they will get more involved. And that's what I'm saying about Tiger Woods. I think the time will come when his career finishes, when he will get a lot more engaged uh, with these kind of messages that Rory is involved in at the moment. And, and uh, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, although it's, it's uh, very worthy of Rory to be doing this, is it taken away from his performances? Um, that would be the question I would have as a performer for Rory McIlroy. Um, because first and foremost, um, as much as we all have our views, and, and there's no doubt Rory has some strong views, mm. he is striving also to win major championships, be the best player in the world, and, and win major championships. And, and that takes a lot of desire, a lot of attention, and bringing attention into you from stuff that's not golf-related. Um, I don't see any other sports, the greats, the real greats in, in the game, like we're talking about Rory McIlroy here, here um, having done that, because, as I say, for the reasons I just said, is that what might end up separating him from the other greats, though? He actually is the one who, despite everything being on the line, and we all hope he goes on over the next two or three years and wins those majors that should be coming, considering the way he was playing pre-COVID-19, that actually he's looked at his career and doesn't, and he said that, like, not just a golfer, that actually there's something more to Rory McIlroy than just the majors, because he can never compare to Tiger Woods in terms of major championships, in terms of success, but he can compare to him in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. Time is going to tell us that, Nathan. Mm. Um, time is going to tell us that. And uh, as I say, as, as wordy as it is for, for, for his views and, and, and what they're saying, and a lot of people agree, but also a lot of people disagree, you know. And, and as I say, it, it, it's, um, it, it's up to Rory how he sees his career. Um, you know, you get the impression with him that he's got such a, a wide mind. He's not singular focused um, like some of the greats in sport have been, like Tiger Woods. I mean, he would just stand in, in your way to get, to get where he wants to go. And you get the sense from Rory that his world is a lot bigger than that. But my question is, that big worldliness that he has, is that affecting his performance when it comes to, um, when it comes to being a champion uh, mm. of, of the size of, of a superstar size that, 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 uh, that Tiger Woods has? We all know he's got the talent. We all have seen that. And, you know, and he wins very regularly and he's number one player in the world. But ultimately, at the end of the, end of the day, he's going to be uh, judged by how many major championships he wins. And, and that's what's going to give him that real iconic status more than anything else. And that starts next week in America. Is it impossible to predict how the actual golf is going to go? Because I guess we've never been in this situation where all the players are returning to the course having played no golf in three, four months, all right, they'll have had injury layoffs, but all of them returning together. Would your sense be that the likes of Rory are thinking, all right, that USPGA is my focus. I just want to get back up to almost match fitness over the coming weeks. Or do you want to somehow mentally get into the stage of where when golf finished and he was very much the best player in the world? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just getting the wheels turning again competitively. Um, you know, a lot of the players... Um, we're able to play a lot of golf, as I said earlier, over this lockdown period where, where a lot of counties in Florida and states, some states were not closed down to golf. Um, so uh, getting his game back up to speed, I mean, most of the players will do that within a week, 10 days, to be honest, Nathan. You don't all of a sudden lose your game and you need three months to build up again. You know, you don't, you don't need massive fitness levels like maybe a soccer player, a rugby player might need. So um, 
I think they'll get that up to speed. What they lose is that competitive edge. So it's getting the wheels turning. But I think the big difference going back now, uh, we talk about this new norm. We're going back to that again. And the big challenge for Rory and the big challenge for Tiger and the big challenge for Brooks and all these guys going back is that this is going to be a different world for them that they go back into with no crowds and getting used to the silence and getting used to no crowds and being prepared for it and mentally being engaged with all of that stuff um, and, and still producing a performance. That's going to be a real challenge and they've got to be ready for that mentally. As much as their physical game will probably be ready, the biggest hurdle is going to be, and the guys who will have success are the guys who are mentally ready to embrace this, what they call the new norm. And not having a gallery of 40 people blocking your tee shot going from out of bounds. Might be a, well, a, yeah. some of them as well. I heard, yeah, I heard Brooks saying there's going to be a lot more balls lost and stuff like that. <laughs> and there will be as well. And, and no free drops from going over the backs of grandstands and players hitting into grandstands on purpose. So, yeah, there's all of those things that uh, we'll enjoy watching and, and yeah. picking apart as it goes. And uh, I have no doubt. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I, I, I'll be surprised if Rory doesn't win a major championship uh, this year. I do. I, I think the venue suit him. I think his game has never been in a better place. Um, and as I say, if he gets his focus right, the big thing with him now is the focus uh, and keeps that focus, you know, in the right place. And um, mm. I think the world is his oyster. Yeah, here's hoping. Uh, it promises to be a very interesting autumn for McElroy and golf in general. Starting, though, at the Centurion, Paul McGinley, are you going to be feeling the pressure? It's going to be on Sky Sports. Have you got your game? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready? Have you been out practicing? Yeah. I have. I'm, I'm trying my happy Gilmore's, all right? I'm trying to do those. I'll tell you, that's not easy. So I've been doing a bit of putting. I have an indoor putting thing here. Okay. So I've been doing that. So that should be all right. Uh, the happy Gilmore's are the thing I'm a bit worried about. What's moment, the most difficult part of the happy Gilmore? I think, is, is it that you need to just fully embrace it? You've got to go all in. You can't think I look like an idiot here. you just got to go for it. Yeah. Well, we're a little bit fortunate being Irishmen, you know, with, with a hurl. But, Maybe not mm. down in Mayo, you wouldn't be as good as, as, as we are up in Dublin. Uh, wow. but, uh, <laughs> Don't see Dublin winning too many all Ireland's in hurling. <laughs> well, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a little bit like a hurling move, but it's all about mm. the coordination like everything else in golf. You know, it's getting your feet planted at the right time so that you can swing your arms. So it's all right, it's a coordination thing. Bit All more right. practice to be done. Bit more practice. You've got you've got a little bit of time. Uh, we look forward to tuning in, Paul. Great stuff. It look, promises to be a great afternoon to say the lineup is brilliant. Tommy Fleetwood, Beef Johnson, Thomas Bjorn, and Carly Booth alongside yourself for the professionals. And then Harry Kane, Piers Morgan, Peter Crouch, Freddie Flintoff, and Jamie Redknapp. It is the Paddy Power Golf Shootout. And it's going to be an interesting format. There's a shootout and there's also some skills challenges in there as well. Paul, best of luck with it and best of luck over the next few weeks. We look forward to watching you again on Sky Sports. You're welcome, Nathan. Thank you.